You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, episode 36. Today we're going to talk about that new movie, Noah. And what's up with those rock monsters anyway? We're going to get into the theology and a little bit of analysis all in today's podcast. Thank you for tuning in to The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. And my goal this week is to share with you what I liked and what I did not like theologically in the new Noah movie with Russell Crowe. It came out in 2014. And I'm also going to discuss the most confusing part of that movie, the rock monsters. That's right. And this question that comes up all the time in the Bible, who or what were the Nephilim, the giants of old described in Genesis chapter 6? And also, who were the watchers? If you've done any research on this movie and those rock monsters, you've probably come in contact with the idea of the watchers. This comes from the book of Daniel and also from the apocryphal book, First Enoch. We're going to touch on all of that. But before we do, I want to give a little spot here to my son, Blaze. He is number six out of seven. You'll remember him from last week's show, his Medieval Times debut with his outfit without the pants. It was awesome. Anyway, he wanted to say a little something, and here goes. Hey, episode 36. Episode 46. Taylor Marshall Show. Taylor Marshall Show. Bye. Bye. All right, bye. I love you. I love you. Bye. All right, there he is, the Blaze. We call him Blazer or Blazy. Let's start off with our joke. This is a short one. What kind of lights did Noah install on the ark? Floodlights. Now, I was interested. We took the uh, listener poll last week. A lot of you uh, went in and, and left results there. Thank you so much. I enjoyed reading them. And if you'd like to take the podcast listener poll, I'd love it. Uh, just go to taylormarshall.com. At the top of the page, click on weekly podcast. And the first thing you see will be that poll. You can take a look at it. And one of the things I asked in the poll was this. Are the jokes funny? Are they not funny? Or are they just too cheesy? And you know what? It was unanimous. I was really surprised actually to see this, that everyone said that they thought it was funny. 100%. So that's great. You know, I've always kind of wondered whether y'all groan and think these jokes are are horrible. Uh, But most people like them. Actually, not most. All so far have responded. Um, Some of the other things from uh, from the reader survey is most people, that is 77%, like the show to be at around 30 minutes. Also, the favorite part of the show, 88%, like the featured segment. That's the long treatment we do every week. Also, um, I asked, do you like it when I talk about my personal life and struggles? And there's three choices there. One is, um, I like your personal anecdotes. Please share more. The second one, it's currently in perfect balance. Keep it as is. And the third one is no. Is the third one says no? Please knock it off. I don't want to hear about your life. Fortunately, most people like it just as it is, with a few wanting more. No one yet has said no. I don't want to hear about your life. So I guess that's a good thing. Uh, And then also we asked, how could we make this better? How could we make the podcast better? And a lot of people wrote in. Some people said uh, they like it as it is. They can't think of anything else. Some people said we'd love to have Joy on, your wife. So I think we're going to do that here soon. Some people said they'd like some more church history, um, more on the saints, and um, 
more on the parables and a lot of good ideas here. So I'm going to keep continue to look through these results and I'll craft future podcast episodes based on what it is that you want to hear. Um, also, we had a lot of people sign up for the new St. Thomas Institute. I want to give a shout out to some of the new members. So shout out goes out to Barbara Smith. Welcome to the new St. Thomas Institute. Richard Ferris, Cynthia Hashimoto, and Richard Gerard Evans. Welcome aboard, Richard. See you on Facebook. That's great. And if you'd like to become a member of the New St. Thomas Institute, let me tell you what it is. Have you ever wanted to study theology? Do you feel inadequate when you try to explain your Catholic faith to other people? Do you wish you were a little bit better at apologetics? Well, most people can't afford and they, and they certainly can't move to another city to study theology and philosophy and Thomas Aquinas and all these things. And so we've put together what's called the New St. Thomas Institute. It's a monthly membership, just like a, a gym membership. And what you get are videos, MP3s, notes, documents, and some bonuses that come out every month. And you can study these on your own time, whatever you like. And it's been very popular. We have over 1,000 members. We're on all six continents. And so it's an opportunity to take your faith to the next level and to study theology, Catholic theology with me. So I take some of the stuff I talk about here on the podcast, but we go a lot deeper and there's a lot more there. So if you enjoy these podcasts, but you say, you know, I wish I could study more about Thomas Aquinas or Augustine or the Blessed Virgin Mary and have some in-depth analysis on all those kind of topics or how to answer atheists, then the new St. Thomas Institute is what you need. And we're doing a big rehaul with a bunch of new features that are going to come out hopefully by the end of this summer. And it's going to be awesome. There's there's some things I want to tell you about, but we have to wait. We're going to keep them under wraps until we're ready to announce it. But I think those of you that are members are going to be blown away by the new stuff. And those of you that aren't members are going to be really impressed with what we're offering. So stay tuned on that. Now let's go to our weekly tip of the week. Uh, lately, I've been using this thing called a text expander. A text expander is, you, is something you type in on your computer, let's just say two letters, and it expands it to a few words, even a whole paragraph, even, for example, an entire email. So, for example, I use a text expander on my Mac called Type It For Me. I did some research on a bunch of different text expander applications, and I concluded this was the best one for me. So I got myself Text Expander, and I've created a bunch of, of um, short codes or clippings. So, for example, if I write the letter GS, if I type that anywhere on my computer, it'll automatically put Godspeed, comma, and then I'll put in Taylor Marshall because that's how I usually sign off my emails, right? Or if I write NST, it's going to put out New St. Thomas Institute because I type that a lot. If I put T... Y-O-U, it automatically puts in thank you. Or if I put office ad, it puts out my entire office address. So these are things that I type over and over and over all week long. And they're repeated enough, so I have these little codes. All I do is type the code, and it inserts it into my Microsoft Word document, an Excel sheet, a blog post, an email, whatever I'm working on. And it's saving me a ton of time. I've been re- It's saving me more time than I had guessed it would. So I would encourage you to get one of these. You know, they're pretty cheap. I think most of them run from anywhere from 10 to $30. You install it on your computer, and then you choose your own codes and outputs. It takes a little while to set up. It took me an hour or so to set it up. But I think I've definitely saved maybe five hours already because I do a ton of typing on this. So the one I use is called Type It For Me, and there's a bunch of others. Just Google Text Expander and shop around. And if you don't want to waste time researching, go with the one I chose. Type it for me. I have no relationship to their company. I get nothing for it. It's just the one that I chose. And now we'll move on to our proverb of the week. Well, the proverb of the week is Proverbs chapter 31, verse 25. reads like this, quote, Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come, end quote. This comes from the famous last chapter of Proverbs, Proverbs 31, which describes the ideal woman. 
it describes wisdom personified as a woman. And as we learn from the church fathers and from the liturgy, the ideal woman is none other than the Blessed Virgin Mary, our spiritual mother in the order of grace. Uh, she is the woman of valor, the woman of strength, who cares for her children in a perfect way. But this verse here, of course, Mary is the type of the church. And so this verse here applies to all of us who belong to the church. We look to Mary. She prays for us. She helps us. She inspires us. She gives us hope. But also she gives us an example that we are to follow as we seek to be perfect disciples of her son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, strength and dignity are her clothing. This means for the Christian, for the baptized follower of Jesus Christ, your clothing should be strength and dignity. This plays off of last week's um, lesson about fortitude. All of us are called to have fortitude, this virtue, this cardinal virtue of fortitude, and also dignity. We Christians should have a certain dignity, a certain decorum. And then I want to move on to the last part of the verse. This is why I chose it. And she laughs at the time to come. We say at the end of the rosary that she is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. That's, in the, that's at the very end of the Salve Regina. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope. Now, obviously, God is our hope. But when we look to Mary, we realize that she is an icon of hope. She saw Jesus Christ suffer on the cross, and yet she had perfect hope. And therefore, she can laugh at the times to come. And I think a lot of us look to the future. We look, for, we look towards the times to come, and we start to frown. We get discouraged. Maybe we even get depressed because we look to the future and we think bad things are coming. But if we are true children of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we belong to him, we place our faith, our hope, and our charity in Christ, we need to trust everything, our lives, our finances, our children, our parents, everything. We can laugh at the days to come. We can know that everything is going to work together according to God's plan. And that's today's message from the Proverbs. You too can laugh at the times to come. Every single day, I walk down the hallway in my house, and on the hallway, as I walk out of my bedroom to the left side, is a complete puzzle, a giant puzzle framed of Noah's Ark. I finished this puzzle when I was in high school. I don't know how many pieces. It's a big one. Thousand, five thousand pieces, I'm not sure. It's a giant puzzle of Noah's Ark that an artist rendered, and I did that in high school and had it framed, and it's when the, our kids come out of the bathroom, they see that giant framed puzzle. And I've always liked the story of Noah. And so when I heard this movie was coming out with Russell Crowe in it called Noah, uh, I went on the internet, I found a trailer of it back before the movie came out, and I watched it, and the special effects looked amazing. I was really pumped and really excited. And then as it was released, I heard a lot of people, you know, of course, mostly Christians and a lot of Catholics, complaining about the movie, how it was not a biblical movie. Now, this didn't really surprise me because most renditions of biblical topics do not follow the Bible. There's two reasons for that. The first is the Bible doesn't often supply all the details to make a full length film and so the director and the writers have to supply footage to fill it out secondly they want to make money that's right people who make movies are doing it to make money people in hollywood are not trying to evangelize america for our lord jesus christ they're trying to make money and so if they can make a film that has a little controversy to it guess what more people are going to talk about it more people are going to go see it and more people are going to make money. Now, going back to the first element, and that is these biblical movies don't often follow the Bible, 
I don't think necessarily that is a bad thing as long as the message isn't destroyed. A lot of people who complain about the Noah movie and how unbiblical it is and how it doesn't follow the script, I know those people show their kids Veggie Tales movies. You know what I'm talking about? Veggie Tales. This is where they take biblical stories and have them performed by vegetables like squashes and carrots and asparagus and all that. Okay, we, we watch them too. They're silly. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them, but it's kind of a double standard if we're going to criticize um, Hollywood renditions and then also uh, fill our children's minds with vegetable biblical fantasies. Um, and also movies like The Passion of the Christ. I love that movie. I talk about it a lot uh, on the podcast and sometimes in New St. Thomas Institute. But it also does not follow the Bible perfectly. For example, when our Lord's being scourged, Satan appears holding this little uh, deformed, nasty-looking demon baby. It's a spoof on the Madonna icon. Instead of Mary holding the Christ child, we see Satan holding a deformed, um, ugly-looking creature. Uh, there's obviously a great spiritual significance to that, but it's not biblical. The director, Mel Gibson, made that up and put it into the movie for a greater dramatic effect. And even movies like Going Back to the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, these also have elements that do not follow the biblical chronology or the biblical facts. So I don't necessarily think it is a bad thing that there are certain liberties sometimes taken with the biblical stories. Um, but I think in the case of Noah, we have some serious, serious problems, okay? And we're going to get into those today. Um, this, uh, the, the big thing that people talk about are these rock monsters, right? Every time they say, what do you think of the Noah movie? Oh, they say they're in. What do you think of the rock monsters? And I, don't, I haven't met anyone who, who really liked the rock monsters. I mean, they're cool to look at, but I don't think they really added much to the movie. They were sort of like... Ents from Lord of the Rings. Remember the Ents, those tree guys who they come alive and they, you know, they fight the bad guys. There's these giant, slow-moving trees. Well, they were like the rock version of the Ents, and they were visually entertaining to watch. But from a dramatic point of view, they didn't add too much. We're going to talk about where those come from in the Bible. What is the director trying to accomplish with these rock monsters? And then, last of all. We're going to talk about uh, the characters of Noah and his wife. And my take on it is that Noah is a Calvinist and his wife is a Catholic. I don't think the directors intended this, but I'm going to explain to you why I think that is. Okay, so let's talk about the movie. Uh, I went to go see it by myself. I had heard all sorts of things from all kinds of people. How It was a horrible movie, so I was expecting the worst but everyone was asking me about it, and if I do a review, and if I talk about it, so I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll go see the movie. I'll see it by myself. Joy was going down um, with the kids to see our newly born niece, and she was born in Austin, so my wife went down to Austin, Texas. I stayed behind, and one night after I finished up some bunch of work with the New St. Thomas Institute, I drove to the movie tavern, and I got a drink and some nachos, and I watched the Noah movie. And immediately I was struck by how uh, beautiful the film was. From an aesthetic point of view, um, I thought, you know, like that raindrop that became a flower and um, some of the imagery was really striking. And I, I really did enjoy that. However, as the movie went along, I began to feel the train go off the tracks. And let me explain what I mean by that. So, Right at the beginning, you're introduced to these rock monsters. And these are derived from what's, from what's called the Watchers. And the Watchers come from the book of Daniel. It's really the only time in the canonical books of the Bible that the Watchers are mentioned. You can find them in Daniel chapter 4. And just for reference, they're mentioned at verse 13, 17, and 23 in the Hebrew. And here, a watcher is defined as, and I quote, a holy one coming down from heaven, end quote. So these are angels that come down from heaven to aid human beings. And if you've seen the movie Noah, you realize that that's exactly what these rock monsters do. They've come down from heaven to help 
humans and you'll see that they also help Noah build the ark and at the end they have this big battle to protect Noah. I'm going to talk a little bit more about their martyrdoms and what that's supposed to signify in just a little bit. Now, the real story behind this Noah movie, to the surprise of many people, is not really the Bible. It's based on another text related to the Bible, but not the Bible itself. My personal theory, my pet theory, is that the movie is based loosely on an apocryphal Jewish text called First Enoch. Now, First Enoch was highly revered by the early Jewish Christians. As a matter of fact, St. Jude, he cites the book of First Enoch in his epistle. So if you go to Jude, verse 14 and 15, you'll see there that St. Jude cites the book of First Enoch. Now, the book of First Enoch was compiled over time. However, the oldest section of First Enoch comes from about 300 BC, 300 years before the birth of Christ. And that oldest section, that oldest core of First Enoch, is called the Book of the Watchers. And it describes how there were certain angels who came down from heaven to aid and assist human beings. Unfortunately, when the angels came down, they began to teach them metallurgy, that is, using metals from the earth, right? Excavating the earth, or as you see in the movie, really raping the earth of metals in order to build swords, knives, shields, and armor. And you see this, of course, in the movie. These evil human beings are going about ruining nature and excavating and digging the land to find uh, things to make weapons from, metallurgy. All right. Now, these in the book of First Enoch, these watchers, these angels from heaven, also show humans how to make bracelets, necklaces, and things like that. So to adorn themselves, which is seen as a sign of pride. They also teach the women how to wear makeup, to put... Uh, uh, paint or tinctures on their eyelids and their cheeks, and also to wear costly stones around their necks as jewelry. All right, and then the angels also teach them how to use herbs for magic. They teach them enchantments, spells. They teach them astrology and how to tell the future from the constellations, and signs from heaven, signs on earth, and signs from. The moon. This is all described in the book of First Enoch. Now, all of these things are bad. And so Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, and Uriel, these four archangels, we know Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael from the canonical scriptures. Uriel is not mentioned by name in the canonical scriptures, uh, but he is in the Jewish tradition. He is the angel of fire, and he may very well be the angel of fire described in the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. Anyway, these four angels rise up against the watcher angels who are teaching the humans all of these skills that lead them towards pride and sin, and they come and imprison these watchers. All right, now we see this in the movie. They come to earth, and when they fall into earth, this is in the Noah movie, not in First Enoch and not in the Bible, but in the Noah movie, they fall to earth and they're like these flaming, um, I don't know, comets and they crash into the earth. And when they do, the earth melts and sticks to them. So they become rock monsters. Now, this is sort of a very subtle reference to what happens in First Enoch, because when they are kicked out of heaven, they are imprisoned in earth and in hell, right? And so this, by their angelic bodies, if you can even call them that, being encrusted in earth. You can see that they're imprisoned in the earth. And so in the movie, they kind of talk about how they've been exiled by God, and they sort of have a remorse about it, and they wish they could be reunited to God. All right, so all of this is taken from First Enoch, not from the Bible. So this gives you an insight into understanding the Noah movie. Now, there's another element 
that is not in the movie but is a big part of First Enoch, and that is that these watchers, these angels that come down from heaven to help mankind and teach them metallurgy and makeup and magic, they also want to copulate and fornicate with human women because they find them beautiful. And so the earthly human women have relations with these watchers and they bear children. And these children in the Jewish tradition are called the Nephilim. Nephilim. And Nephilim is Hebrew for the fallen ones. And they are depicted as giants who roam the earth. Mighty men. They're half angel, half human. And they're only mentioned twice in the Bible. They're mentioned at Genesis 6-4 in the context of the flood. And they're mentioned in Numbers 13 verse 33. So you can look up both of those passages. Now I'll read you the verse from Genesis 6, 4. All right. And it goes like this. Now it came about when man began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Okay, end quote. So that actually is from the Bible. That's from Genesis. And Thomas Aquinas treats the Nephilim, guess what, 18 times in his collected work. We don't have time to go through those today, but he does talk about them. And in the Latin and in the Greek, they are called gigans, gigantes, plural. In the genitive, gigantis. These are the giants, where we get the word gigantic. All right, these are giants um, thought to have been sired by fallen angels and human women. Now, the Catholic tradition in the majority position of Christians over time is that this never happened. What is depicted in First Enoch, angels coming down from heaven and fornicating with human women and then women giving birth to superhumans, never ever happened. Instead, when we read this in Genesis 6-4, the sons of God are the children of Seth, the righteous child of Adam and Eve, and the daughters of men are the sinful descendants of Cain. And so what happened is you had the holy righteous people on earth, those who descended from Seth, who obeyed God, and then you had the Cainites who did not obey God. And when these two people began to marry each other and have children, this produced the Nephilim, and this produced the great crisis that called for the flood. Because Philosophically speaking, an angel cannot have relations with a human being. Also, angels would not be able to produce the genetic DNA or the seed necessary to conceive a human child. It's philosophically impossible. So the church instead has said this didn't happen. Instead, what we have here are two human races that marry each other, and therefore the worship of God, the love of God, becomes diluted on the face of the earth, and this leads to great sin and therefore the need of a flood. Incidentally, Thomas Aquinas says that there are people who claim to have had relations with demonic beings, and you'll know these, uh, they're called in the singular incubus and succubus, and these are demonic night creatures um, who apparently have relations with humans and steal their, um, how do I put this, genetic material, right? So the seed from men and the ova from women and conceive children that way. It's a very kind of unusual theory. Thomas Aquinas does talk a little bit about it in the Summa Theologiae. It's in the first part, and I can't remember the, which question it is right now, um, but it's definitely in Prima Pars, the first part. Now, the director of this film, I just want to clarify real quick. 
according to Catholic tradition, the whole idea of the watchers coming down and mating with women never happened. Okay. Now, according to the director, Darren Aronofsky, he stated that he attempted to make, and I quote, the least biblical, biblical film ever made. Okay, so he wanted to make the least biblical, biblical film ever made. And I'm going to give him um, a high five on that, not because I think it's good to make unbiblical films, but he definitely succeeded because this is a biblical f- film that does not follow the Bible. It has the right, the same names, similar plot line, but it's a different story altogether. So what director Darren Aronofsky has done, he's taken the book of First Enoch and he's literally flipped the script so that the watchers are the good guys, not the bad guys. Let me repeat that. Director Darren Aronofsky has taken the story of First Enoch He's flipped the script so that the watchers, these bad angels that come down to heaven to corrupt men, are not the bad guys, but he's made them into the good guys. All right? So he's taken this idea of the watchers. He has imprisoned them, as it said in First Enoch, but they're imprisoned in earthly matter, rock, dirt. He's turned them into these giant ents, which are visually appealing for the moviegoer. And they help Noah build the ark and then fight off all the human sinners that try to take over the ark. So the watchers or the rock monsters in this movie, they don't want to copulate with human women. They are there to help Noah. So the idea of the watchers from first Enoch is there. It seems it's not said in the movie that perhaps these watchers had something to do with the corruption of humans. Maybe this is why they're interested in mining and getting metal and weapons, and they're into sexual license, as we see in the movie. Maybe they did something there, and they are looking for redemption. The rock monsters are looking for salvation. Okay? Now, the the Watchers were kicked out of heaven, just like we read in 1 Enoch, and they're on the earth, And at the end of the film, if you've seen it, and this is a spoiler alert, so if you don't want to know what happened at the end, fast forward this podcast. But at the end of the film, the rock monsters, the watchers, actually redeem themselves by becoming martyrs. They become martyrs for the sake of Noah's protection. And as they're fighting off the human sinners who are trying to take over Noah's ark, they're fighting, they're fighting, and they're, they're getting beaten. They're getting destroyed. And what we see is as they give their lives up for Noah, they break free of their rock body prisons and immediately shoot up like shooting stars up to heaven and ascend back into heaven. Apparently, they've been saved from their past sins. Now, this is the director, Darren Aronofsky's, Big twist. This is not in First Enoch. He follows First Enoch up until this point, but he makes them redeemable and he makes them into good guys. This is a point that is not reconcilable with historic Catholic theology, right? Once an angel sins, he can never go back. We did a a, a lesson on this in the New St. Thomas Institute on the fall of Lucifer. And we learned that when an angel commits a sin, his intellect is so big, so immense, so smart, that when he makes a decision, it's irrevocable, right? So when an angel sins and becomes a demon, he can never turn back. A human has a a much smaller intellect, a weaker intellect. We don't understand the future that well as compared to angels. And therefore, we can repent, right? We can turn back, but an angel cannot, according to historic Christian, Christian theology. So Aronofsky has changed that. Now, my big worry about the movie is that there's a Gnostic subplot. And in the movie, they call God every time the creator. And the creator seems to be kind of a bad guy. You know, you don't really like the creator in the movie. He created apparently Adam and Eve in the movie. You see that. And when they sinned, he kicked them out. And he's had no interaction with humans ever since. 
That's how, the, that's how this movie, this is how Aronofsky's Noah presents it. And so humans are resentful and they're angry towards God. And Noah himself, in the movie, not in the Bible, believes that God wants to kill all humans, including him, his wife, and his children. In the movie, the only reason that there's an ark is so that all the, all the animals can be saved. And then Noah, his wife, and his children are going to die. Right? There are, there's only one um, daughter-in-law, and she's barren in the movie. And the other two sons have no spouses, no, no girls uh, that they could marry and have children with. Now there's a big uh, twist in that, in that uh, Japheth's wife conceives and has twin girls, and this allows the human race to continue. And Noah wants to kill the two baby girls because if there are fertile females on earth, that means the human race can continue through his bloodline. And he believes God does not want humans to continue. Humans are too depraved. And this brings me to the last point, which is, in the movie, Noah is a Calvinist and Noah's wife is a Catholic. This is the only thing in the movie that I like. I thought this was done well. The, the movie itself was not biblical, but this little dialogue throughout the movie between the husband and the wife, I think, is from a wide-angle lens biblical. Noah believes in total depravity. He believes humans are utterly and completely, totally depraved. They have nothing good in them whatsoever. They should be justly destroyed by an omnipotent God. They have sinned. They are wrong. They should all die. And Noah believes that is what God desires. And, he want, and that's, what he, that's what he believes God wants him to do. So when two baby girls are born on the ark, he believes that God would want him to kill those humans because God wants to kill humans. Humans are utterly sinful and depraved. But Noah's wife has a different point of view. She believes that God is a God of mercy, and that there's something in man that's redeemable. Man, yes, he's fallen. She grants that she would, in fact, do evil things and sins to protect her own children. But she states that there's still something good in man. And what she's pointing to is the image of God, right? She understands that there is original sin, that humans are prone to evil, but yet there's something there worth saving, right? Not that God is obliged to save us. He doesn't have to. It's totally his mercy, 100% his grace. But she sees that man can still have a relationship with God. And so she's begging Noah, don't kill these baby girls. Don't kill our grandchildren. Maybe God has a plan. Maybe God wants to be merciful to our family. And I think that really is a beautiful message. And I think that really is the heart of the gospel. I think it shows two ways of looking at humans. One is a sub-Christian or anti-Christian understanding of man. Man is totally depraved. He is destroying the earth. God hates him. Let's get rid of him. Let's contracept so that there's no more humans. Let's abort so there's no more humans. Let us conserve the earth in such a way that humans are dispensable for the sake of being, quote-unquote, green. That is Noah in the movie. And then there's Noah's wife, who comes with a more Catholic message. That is, yes, we're sinful. Yes, man has somehow turned his back on God. But there's also something in man that could, with the help of divine grace, be something heroically good. Man could be made into a saint. And God is holding out his hand and providing a way for man to continue under his watchful and merciful gaze. And in the movie, we see that when Noah is about to, to stab those babies with a knife, suddenly he breaks down. He sees something good. He has compassion and mercy and he becomes uh, conformed to the image of the true God. All right, so that's, that's the good thing. And I think that the movie is worth discussing simply because of that dynamic. Again, it is not biblical. 
This did not happen in the Bible. In fact, Noah in the Bible knows all along why God is doing this. And Noah apparently all along knows that God's going to redeem his family and start a new human race from him. So again, what's good about this movie, ironically, has nothing to do with the Bible. So that's my take on this new movie, Noah, directed by Darren Aronofsky. I think Aronofsky has a, uh, how do I say this, um, a subtle and destructive uh, subplot, if you will, to this movie. I think he, in a certain sense, is mocking Christianity, especially by making the idea of the Watchers uh, a redeemable um, character in the film. And I also think that the way he presents humanity is sort of in line with a militant, eco-green understanding that humans are the plague of the earth. Humans must be destroyed. But he does place this character of Noah's wife in there, which gives us hope. Let's us laugh at the days to come. So would I recommend that you see this movie? Well, it's not the kind of movie that you should go to to just space out and be entertained. This movie requires vigilance. It requires discernment. I wouldn't let younger people or people who aren't theologically trained to see this movie because it would really confuse them and perhaps, well not perhaps, likely create a lot of theological dissonance in their souls. There's a lot of um, confusing things going on here. However, if you've studied theology, if you've studied the Gnostics, if you're familiar with First Enoch and these biblical stories and uh, you want to see the movie, I think it could be a really interesting movie to talk about with um, others, especially if you talk about some of the themes that we chased out today. So there it is, uh, the Noah 2014 movie. And if you have a comment, if you've seen the movie, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear if you think I, I nailed it or I missed the mark. So go to taylormarshall.com and click on weekly podcast at the top and go down to episode 36 on the Noah movie and leave me a comment. I'd love to have a conversation with you. And if you have a different take, I definitely would like to hear your perspective on this movie. And we'll be back in just a moment. Okay, we're coming up with our Latin word of the week. I'm going to hold off on that. Maybe you can guess what it's going to be. I actually mentioned the word in the featured segment today. Before we get to the Latin Word of the Week, I just want to say, hey, I've got a gift waiting for you. If you haven't downloaded my book, Thomas Aquinas in 50 Pages, for free, do so now. TaylorMarshall.com. Go over there, TaylorMarshall.com, upper right corner. I'm giving away a free book, Thomas Aquinas in 50 Pages. Go there, download it, begin studying and learning about Thomas Aquinas. Your life will never be the same. Also, if you enjoy this podcast, it comes out every Wednesday, and it's available through iTunes. If you subscribe, it'll come automatically to your mobile device. And I also want to thank everyone who's gone to iTunes and left a rating. I really appreciate you so much for going over there, um, and I want to give a shout out to David W., Emmaus135, Jeremy Matt Lick. I loved what Jeremy said. Jeremy said this over at iTunes. So glad to have found this podcast. Taylor gives you practical lessons to lead a more virtuous and Christ-centered life. A nice blend of daily wisdom, humor, and straightforward tips to up your spiritual game. Wow. Thanks, Jeremy. That's awesome. I just That was very poetic the way you wrote that. I love that. Um, also, shout out going out to Kevin Arenas, Arca1, and Ant Jack, all of you, thank you so much for the five-star reviews and, and all the nice things you wrote there. And I would appreciate it if you're listening and you haven't reviewed this podcast, please do so. It helps other people find this podcast in iTunes. The more ratings there are, the more iTunes promotes it and suggests it and ranks it up higher. And you can do that by going to iTunes, search their Taylor Marshall Show, and then you can leave a rating. It takes about 20 seconds or so. Uh, it's real quick. And again, thank you to everyone who's left a rating. I really, really, really appreciate you. And I thank you once again. Now, the Latin word of the week is 
gigans, gigans. In the genitive gigantes, it means a giant, where we get the word gigantic. And in the Septuagint and in the Vulgate, we find that these Nephilim are described as giants. So they're just big human beings. And if you want to learn more about these, you can check out a blog post I did earlier this week. Did St. Augustine find dinosaur bones? I was reading The City of God, and there St. Augustine talks about finding fossilized bones, large bones. I suggest that he found dinosaur bones. Augustine thinks he found some bones related to these gigantes, these Nephilim, these giants. Um, I'll leave it for you to decide. You can read the passages there. If you go to taylormarshall.com and search, did St. Augustine find dinosaur bones? You can read the whole article there. Well, hey, thanks so much for listening to this podcast. I hope you learned a little something about the new Noah movie, First Enoch, Gnostics, and how to discuss with your family and friends this very popular movie. And like I said, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, so please leave a comment. Go to taylormarshall.com, click on Weekly Podcast at the top of the page, and click on Episode 36. Leave a comment. I look forward to engaging you there. And in the meantime, remember, our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth, So go out there and be salty.